Lead Me Winter Training School Madrid 2021 Media Accessibility Training, Sign Language and Subtitling for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Organised by the Tradaval Research Group and AVLA Project at Complutense University Madrid Sound in Film, um, Can You See Me? In this workshop we will be focusing on the nature of sound um, its importance in film, especially because as audiovisual translators that we are, we need to understand um, how sound works and to be able to make it available to those who cannot see. Just as um, we do the opposite exercise of perhaps um, making what is visual uh, auditory uh, and we know that in film one plus one equals one so as audiovisual translators it is very very important that we become um, qualified or uh, excellent readers not only of the visual elements but also of the auditory elements um, let us begin by thinking about the audiovisual construct we all know that the audiovisual text is a complex whole that is a sum of different elements. Um, we know that the visual component is uh, the, success, uh, the uh, continuous um, succession of still images that are put together at a high rate to give us the illusion of movement and that the auditory uh, component is also uh, a complex whole um, that comes with um, music, sound effects and speech. Uh, and speech in itself is also um, um, a collection of elements that come from the actual words, the linguistic elements, the way those words are spoken, the paralinguistic information, um, intonation, rhythm, um, even um, um, speci specificities of each person's way of speaking, but also non-linguistic elements uh, such as the visual um, component of lip movement, uh, kinetics, um, all the body gesturing that comes with speech. So as audiovisual translators that we are, we need to understand how these different elements um, exist as independent um, um, codes uh, and the way they interact with each other and change the meaning of each other simply because they are working together. If we are to think about um, the most conventional forms of audiovisual translation, we will see that um, this translation will be focusing on specific parts of this whole construct. Um, subtitling, for instance, when we think about interlingual subtitling, um, we tend to have an add-on of the translated um, words, um, speech, and very little more beyond that. Um, probably some paralinguistic information will come in the form of punctuation, but it's a simple addition um, of um, a visual addition of the speech component, um, usually in a different language. Still within these most traditional forms of uh, audio visual translation and if we are to think about voiceover um, the original continues to be there and we add a new layer of sound allowing uh, the original sound uh, to continue living while we are listening to this edition usually in a different language. Now dubbing goes a little bit further and <laughs> If we think about Disney, it goes as far as substituting everything, music, sound effects, uh, the speech. Uh, the only thing it does not cover um, 
I cannot cover will be the visuals because um, we will continue to be seeing the lip, lip movement and we know that that is one of the major constraints in dubbing uh, is having synchrony to this visual element that continues to be there uh, from the original text. If we are to think about the accessibility uh, elements that we add uh, for the benefit of people who cannot hear uh, or cannot see, um, this addition that we are uh, bringing into the audiovisual whole um, will be an addition for those who might have all their senses in optimal use, but will be a full substitution for those who are lacking either in hearing or in the case of audio description sight. So let's think about subtitling for deaf and hard of hearing audiences. We have an addition of subtitles uh, that will go beyond speech. Though these uh, subtitles will also contain information about the music, the sound effect. Very often um, the addition of uh, the, identifying the speaker and if that is also necessary, information about how uh, words are spoken. So that paralinguistic uh, element will be made explicit. Most of the times, um, subtitling for deaf and hard of hearing audiences will be within the same language. But why shouldn't SDH be interlingual as well? And if we are to think about audio description for blind audiences, then everything that is visual will need to be substituted for the benefit of those who cannot see. And that substitution it simply turns the auditory, uh, sorry, the visual into auditory uh, information. But again, it will be constrained by the auditory component that already exists in the original film. So clearly, as uh, audiovisual translators, we have to be highly aware of the nature of image and the nature of sound to be able to do our job properly. And that is exactly what we will be seeing um, after this. And uh, as far as the grammar of film goes, uh, credits to Chandler Daniel with a brilliant online resource that has I have used uh, for years on end uh, to very systematically and um, easily summarize what we are looking at when we are um, analyzing film. Obviously, we need to look at the camera angles, uh, distance, uh, from uh, the very uh, close-ups, the extreme close-ups to the extreme uh, long uh, scenes right at the end, all of them with different uh, meanings were used for different effects, um, the shot angles, uh, where the camera is positioned, uh, how this changes uh, our perception of the characters, how a bird's eye view will be making the character look insignificant, or uh, the worm's eye will be uh, creating this giant uh, character that is strong, or the canted angle will be suggesting that there's something not quite right. Um, the camera movements, the lens, whether it's panning or uh, tilting, all these elements that um, are conveying messages and are talking to us in discrete ways, but definitely will have an impact in what we will be translating, how we will be translating, and even how we will be integrating the sound elements once they come one plus one equals one, once they come together with these different camera movements, camera angles, 
um, points of view. We all know that film is not simply about static image, and we know that the editing will also add um, new information. Editing that will be uh, will be making uh, very important um, taking very important decisions in terms of the visual narrative, but editing that will also have an impact in the sound component. And if anything is important or <laughs> another important element in film is the fact that film is all about manipulation and the manipulation of time to make us believe that in the hour and a half that we are sitting in the cinema, we are living through a century or we are sitting for an hour and a half only to see five minutes in the life of whoever is on the big screen. Um, last but not least, every uh, different genre, every uh, different filmmaker will have uh, a different narrative style, will be adding subjective treatment to both image and sound, will be um, creating or using different techniques to manipulate um, our perception of the story that is being unfolding um, for those hour and a half in front of our eyes. And there are other aspects which we could go on and on and on uh, discussing the lighting, the graphics and the genre, etc, etc, etc. I started by summarizing and revising these visual components because and it's never too much to repeat. When we are analyzing sound in film, we will need to analyze it in context. And the context that comes with sound in film will always be image. And every image is in itself a whole composition. We cannot decode sound unless we place it within this composition unless we understand all these different nuances, all these different um, messages that are being built upon uh, as all these elements are brought together in the film. Anyway, what we had for our session today was to focus on sound. Because as we are discussing subtitling for deaf and hard of hearing audiences, we are definitely looking at ways in which we can compensate for a part of the film that our intended addressees cannot fully access. Unless we really understand the nature of sound in the different moments in the film, it will be incredibly difficult to find ways in which to convey that sound. So let us now um, dive a little bit deeper into the nature of sound in film and see how and why we should be giving it a uh, very, very special attention. OK, so in technical terms, we should start off by thinking that sound in film as happens with image, is very complex. We will have direct sound, studio sound, selective sound. Uh, we will have perspective. Sound will be used as a bridge. We will have dialogue, which can be dubbed. We could have asynchronous sound or synchronous sound effects that are parallel or just a wild track. We could have the commentary, the voiceover narration, sound effects music and even silence. In film, silence can be even more, it can be noisier than sound itself. Again, just as happened with analyzing image, we need to learn how to analyze sound uh, and that takes a lot. Um, I need to start by making reference to three works on which 
again, I am basing what I am sharing with you. These are three uh, books which are easily available. And anybody wanting to uh, know more about sound, sound design in film, um, here you will get all the answers uh, you need. Okay, so let's rewind. And let's start by what is sound? Um, I'd love to hear you, if you don't mind, just turn on your mics and um, tell us. What is sound? Silence. Any question? <laughs> any answer for her, please? From the participants. Feels like a very deep question. Um, I, from a physical perspective, it's I guess air vibrations. But then, I is it more about how your brain processes that. Brilliant. Excellent. Yes, it's about vibration and it's about the brain processing. Excellent. Anybody else would like to add? Nope. Okay, let's just move on then. Absolutely right. Sound starts whenever there is motion. Whenever an object moves, sound is produced. Because whenever an object moves, there will be friction, there will be vibration, there will be uh, the air around that object will be touched through the motion of that object. That object will be producing vibration through its energy and will be producing friction on molecules that can be of any sort. And that friction will be conducted through a medium, gas, air, or liquid, or even a solid medium into the ear. We then go into the second part of this process, which I am not going to be discussing here. Um, how does sound travel from your outer ear through your middle ear to your inner ear, your cochlea, then being sent up into your brain, how these electric waves are then decoded in your brain and what happens there. Um, deafness and all that goes around deafness will be the result of some kind of, I do not like the word defect, I would rather say difference in the way the physical apparatus works. But there is much more to deafness than just how the apparatus works. I don't want to think about deafness at this stage. I would like us to uh, focus on hearing. Uh, because unless we understand how we hear, we will not be able to um, even imagine what people do not hear. So let's start by um, organizing ourselves in terms of hearing. There are two processes in hearing. There is a physical perception process, physical and intellectual, and there is a cultural process. There are two axes to, um, to these axles, sorry, to uh, the hearing process. And we start simply by hearing. You either hear or you don't hear. And this is passive. Um, and whether we like it or not, once we have the ability to hear, it's very difficult to close your ears because movement uh, is happening outside and inside you and we will be hearing with our physical body that goes very much beyond our ears. We hear through our whole body, through the liquid 
a component, the water element in our body through our bones. And it is for that reason that it is almost impossible to just keep sound away once your apparatus is working. But then just this passive ability to hear is not important to us as translators because we need to take this hearing further and ultimately we need to arrive at understanding what we hear. And to understand sound, we go through a very active process of decoding. But that decoding requires quite an effort from our part. We hear, but just hearing is not enough. We need to listen. And to listen means to hear with an objective, to consciously tune in to the sounds around you. Once we are listening, we are listening for a purpose. We want to identify the sounds that we are hearing. It is very important that we know what is producing the sound, because if we do not know what is producing the sound, it will be even more difficult to continue. Now, listening and identifying is a process that is a constant going back and forward between hearing and understanding. And at all moments, we are filtering or we are measuring what we hear, what we are listening to um, by this complex cultural process that we all engage with when we are reading the world around us. So when it comes to sound, we start with this immediate identification of the primary forms. It's a dog barking. It's a door banging. It's a woman screaming. It's or a man shouting. It is um, a child speaking Greek or uh, a man speaking um, Swahili, uh, and we may or may not have enough knowledge to decode the sounds that we have identified, but we just stop there. So identification is the first step, but it is the very basic step. Once we identify a sound, we may need to go a little deeper and we will be drawing on our own world experience in our specialized experience of sound to make sense of that sound. And let's go back to the dog barking. If I'm not interested in dogs, um, it might just be a dog barking. But if I am interested in dogs, I might even make sense of the size of the dog, the age of the dog, who knows? I might even come to know if it's a chichawa or if it is uh, a bulldog. My specialized experience with a particular sound will allow me to detect and infer meanings out of nuances that not everybody can uh, pick up. I'm always thinking about what happens with me and my car. Uh, I hear a sound and it sounds strange and I have to run to somebody, first my husband, my son, and then later, very often, a specialized garage where somebody says, oh, madam, that's just your brakes that are not working. Obviously, my immediate identification was simply of my car has a problem. There is a strange sound. But then the specialized experience says, whoops, this sound is caused by a particular element. As audiovisual translators, we may be asking ourselves, how specialized are we in decoding sounds? Because in films, there are cars that break down 
simply because their brakes are not working. Are we capable of decoding those sounds? The very last and most important element comes when we start decoding arbitrary codes, the cultural forms. And let's think of all that comes with reading sound through culture. Um, even the sounds that we produce with our bodies, uh, physiological sounds like burping, for instance, can be decoded as root or might be decoded as a compliment to the cook who produced or who, who cooked a wonderful <coughs> meal. Let's also think about music and how we all decode music through our cultural understandings. Um, again, I can share my personal experience being in the Arab context. Um, I very often listen to Arabic music on the radio and somehow my listening, my hearing apparatus um, does not welcome the quarter tones that the Arabic music brings as part of its natural coding. So again, um, why am I bringing this to your attention? If we want to be truly proficient when we are creating visual solutions uh, to convey sound, we may need to be asking us ourselves questions beyond the what or even the how to these sounds. We may be needing to uh, ask another question, the so what. Um, the sound may be sound or silence, uh, may be pregnant with meanings that go beyond what is superficially there. Okay, so what we've been talking about is nothing other than listening modes. Um, how proficient are we as translators in the way, in the mode with which we listen? And if we go back by listening, we are already moving towards that deliberate effort to understand. Um, there are three types of listening modes. The basic one, the reduced listening mode. You are listening to me in a reduced mode, I would imagine. And probably you are even tired already um, from hearing my voice. You have a real time awareness and you are picking up basic sound quality parameters. I'm speaking English, my accent, uh, my voice, uh, the way I stop, the way I say uh, um, and you are inferring meaning from the words I am um, saying. And because this is mainly verbal, we are okay with our reduced listening mode. But when watching a film, most often we cannot stop at just a re reduced real-time awareness. We need to listen to sound to gather information about its cause. Um, space, object, person that has created the sound, we need to identify, we need to qualify um, a woman's voice. Might she be old? Might she be young? Um, what could her nationality be? Is she speaking in her mother tongue? Um, how is she feeling? What is her mood like? Um, why is she modulating her voice in that particular way? The moment we start asking ourselves all these questions, we are moving into our third listening mode. We may want to decode um, messages in a finer grain. And we want to have a semantic understanding of 
the code system, what, what ideas, what actions, what things are being um, conveyed uh, through that particular conversation or, or, or speech uh, that we may be uh, um, analyzing. Sorry, I said we had three listening modes. I lied. We have four. The very last listening mode, which will be the most acute one, is a referential listening mode. And that referential uh, listening mode goes beyond meaning making, which we will be getting from the semantic listening mode, but rather going into feelings, the emotional and dramatic elements that are perceived uh, in sound, again, be it human voice speaking uh, with a, a verbal uh, message or uh, sound effects or um, music. And we know how different genres in um, cinema, in film, use cinematic codes that we, we know we are going to encounter the moment we enter uh, a cinema uh, space to watch a movie. If we are going to watch a horror film, we will, expect, we will be expecting to hear some screeching, some uh, doors. Um, um, here, I'm lacking words to uh, describe the sounds, um, the wind blowing, the, we can expect to hear people screaming, um, floors um, cracking or... Um, so we come to our um, audiovisual experience in the cinema room with a number of um, preconceived notions, expectations, specialized hearing abilities, and then depending on how interested we are in the film, we will be collecting um, the causes for sounds, the stories that are being told, and we are going to allow ourselves to be led emotionally um, through that storytelling that happens there. I would like to stop here for just a minute and even stop sharing, if I may, just for us to have a quick conversation. And I'm back to the floor um, asking you, um, should you want to turn your cameras on, to um, just share any question you may have, um, any comment you may have uh, on what we have addressed so far. Anybody wanting to comment? Question? Oh, yeah, just, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, I think it's very interesting, um, this discussion on how do we listen because it's, it's very much the crux of um, a lot of work I do looking at chatbots, particularly neural network based ones, because in doing that, we're trying to ask ourselves if we're trying to replicate how people process language, um, you know, to try to replicate that in a in a machine. So, you know, before we even get to trying to replicate a machine, we're actually trying to understand, okay, but how does it work in the first place? So it's interesting um, to hear the, diff the different modalities and um, yeah, I can show you that we're certainly uh, listening uh, attentively, uh, at the very least ca cause, causal listening. Thank you, Peter, absolutely. Uh, I would imagine it is the first stepping stone to any study uh, be it or any work we do, um, unless we really understand what we are trying to work with, um, how will we be able to understand anything else that comes afterwards? How will we be making sense of whether we are producing good or bad um, subtitles 
and I don't like the word good or bad, I'd say adequate uh, subtitles, or how can we even think about um, trying to understand how people perceive uh, this audiovisual whole. Uh, thank you, yes. Any other comments? Any other question? Thank you, Peter. Any nope. other question or comment from the uh, audience? I guess everything is clear so far. Joselia, okay. she's great. <laughs> this means we can continue. So, so far we've been uh, talking about very superficially, uh, we would need more than two hours to go over this, very, very superficially, the very basics of what it means to hear to listen and how complex this can be. Um, perhaps now we can move on to what sounds do we need to address when we are um, looking at film? Um, and we are not even talking about the possibility of subtitling, nor the possibility of describing, because that's not what we're going to be doing for the rest of our time here. Um, it's more becoming truly aware of all these differences and layers uh, that sound takes when we are looking at film. So cool. Um, I will be sharing again and let's continue. Excellent. So um, we stopped by looking at our different listening modes and we are now going to start with film and obviously listening begins with being silent so let's start with silence and we know that silence can be incredibly difficult to deal with any silence makes us feel exposed as if we were laying bare our own listening but also as if we were in the presence of a giant ear tuned to our slightest noises. It's incredible how we become so self-conscious of our internal sounds when there is silence around us. When it comes to film, the ultimate metaphoric sound is silence. If you can get film to a place with no sound where there should be sound, the audience will crowd that silence with sounds and feelings of their own making. And they will individually answer the question, why is it quiet? If the slope to silence is at the right angle, you will get the audience to a strange and wonderful place where the film becomes their own creation in a way that is deeper than any other. I always like to start by talking about sound in film, uh, sorry, silence in film, because we talk, 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 talk about sound, but we don't often talk about silence. And filmmakers use silence to hit us on the head, on the face, on the heart, on the stomach. Probably my request to you all will be the next time you watch film identify the silences as this quote goes we tend to fill in the silences with noises in our head we avoid silence and <laughs> probably simply because we don't know what to do with it one piece of advice that i give myself every time I start analyzing film, before I start translating, before I start thinking about subtitling or audio describing, is let me see exactly where the silence is, what it is doing there, because everything else will come around silence. Every sound starts and ends with silence. Without silence, we wouldn't have sound of any, 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 any sort. So silence will either be the envelope of sound or silence will be sound itself. And when it is 
found itself, we need to stop and go through the whole listening process that we have just seen um, a little while ago. Cool. Let's move on. Be it silence or be it sound, what exactly is sound doing in the audiovisual text? On the one hand, it will be diegetic, um, and it will be diegetic if everything that happens to those people and in the environment portrayed on the scene can then be also heard. It is part of what you see. Or non-diegetic, any sound that would not be heard by a character in the scene, but probably is heard by us. So diegetic, you will remember from what we learned in literature, is part of the story. Non-diegetic is the extra information that the characters themselves in this narrative cannot hear, because we are talking about sound. But we, the observers, the ones sitting in the cinema room, will be hearing. Then. It will be on screen or off screen. And this is really, really simple. A dialogue with limp, uh, lip sync, the door slamming, the footsteps that we can see when people are walking, um, or even the ocean waves. And very often, this off screen, um, so, uh, sorry, on screen sound gives us the impression that it's real. Uh, I often think about National Geographic and uh, how we are conned to believe that all snakes go We are also conned to believe that the crackling of the, uh, the dry uh, leaves that we see in a big close-up in the image um, is exactly what we are hearing. And we forget that so often um, the sound that we think is on screen has been produced um, in post-production, has been added in post-production, has been um, developed in a studio, and has come to be created by things that are not what we can see on screen. But we are happy, we pay to be conned, and we feel ever so uh, impressed by the glossy National Geographic documentary that we are taken to believe um, is so real and so truthful and so faithful to the beauty of nature. But then we cannot forget that most, most of the most impressive sound in film will not be on screen. It comes from backgrounds, it comes from somewhere that is not so obvious to us, and that is the sound that we tend to forget about. That is the sound that comes in through our ears and probably doesn't even go through our head and simply darts to our heart. Uh, that's when um, we are startled, we jump, because um, we aren't expecting a, a particular sound to just be blowing us out of our seat, or we give in to a lullaby and we fall into the, the arms of this, of a musical score or any other sound effect that has been put there, not for us to see, probably not even for us to hear, but most probably for us to feel. Um, and these three layers of see, hear, process in your brain, or feel um, are layers that, again, as audiovisual translators, we need to start bringing apart and analyzing. Is this for me to see? Is this for me to understand? Or is this for me to see? Uh, sorry, to feel. If this is for me to see, uh, Am I already seeing it? If I'm already seeing it through other visual codes, probably it's not that important. But if I cannot see it, and it's for me to understand and process, 
then probably I need to make sure that everybody sees this in some other way. But now, if the sound is to be felt, things get very, very tricky. Because to feel goes beyond this objective uh, element that would come with subtitles that give objective form, verbal form, to sound. But if it is to be felt, just by creating a subtitle, are we not destroying the very nature of this intended effect of feeling? So this is a question that I'm dropping here that I would love to hear your views on later on. Okay, let's move on. So sound has these different functions, can be present in these different ways, but what exactly does sound do then in film? It transmits spatial sensations with great precision. It's interesting that the visual element of distance and direction is per and even space is perceived through hearing, not so much through sight. Distance comes more from how far sound sounds like rather than how small something may seem to us visually. And even space can be so important um, sorry, sound to convey space can be so important and particularly so for blind people. Um, they are using very, very often, I've seen uh, blind people using uh, the bat uh, sonic system of clicking uh, simply to see how big uh, a room is or even to know if the room has a lot of glass, a lot of wood, or if it is furnished, it is empty, um, and how incredibly important sound is to convey space, to convey that which we thought was mainly visual. In audiovisual text, sound also brings um, brings the audiovisual whole uh, together. It holds the image together. Sound very often is just as silence is the envelope to sound. Sound most often is the envelope to image, to what we see. And sound is that which holds this whole visual element together. It is also that which holds us, the viewers, uh, the audience, um, in that space of disbelief. Vision is far more physical than sound. And whereas we have to be focusing and intellectually engaged in seeing, the same doesn't happen with sound. So in the audiovisual text, sound is further to adding information about space. It is also adding cohesion. It is adding ambience. It is manipulating um, the viewer um, at an emotional level, at a cognitive level even at a narrative uh, and linguistic level, sound is what manipulates us uh, to believe or to forget, uh, to suspend belief and to forget the real world outside and to just live the audiovisual experience, particularly in uh, a cinema room that will be using the Dolby surround systems and other subterfuges just to make us uh, live an immersive experience. Sound, most of the time, is allowing for immersion. 
one that is that goes beyond and this I'm repeating beyond hearing and beyond the intellect uh, an immersion that is about again feelings and it's about forgetting that your brain is working simply to let yourself go and to live this imaginary tale that again we are paying to be conned and to live as a unique experience more sound also provides this narrative organization of the audiovisual discourse it gives the coherence the cohesion it is what brings everything together so in audiovisual narrative the images we see are not necessarily the sound we hear the space that we hear is not always the space we see the distances we perceive often do not correspond to the ones we see and finally the space we see and hear do not exist the objects do not exist nor does the space nor the distance between them and the receiver the only thing that exists is a series of organized sounds that make up an acoustic landscape that has to be interpreted. And once again, I will stop sharing because I think what we've just been seeing is pretty important. And again, I would love to hear you. Um, what does all of this suggest to you? This is supposed to be a workshop, remember? This is not a presentation, so I need to hear three people now who would like to share their views, questions. Um, I was just thinking of when you're saying about whether when something on the screen is making a sound and whether or not you need the subtitles or whether they'd actually detract or overshare the information. I was thinking of um, particularly Jurassic Park, the, the ripples in the water, and I was thinking that doesn't need subtitles. You don't need to know there are footsteps at the same time. Like, and and if you said, you know, in brackets, T-Rex footsteps, that would be oversharing. That would, you know. So I think that's a really interesting kind of example of the on-screen sound that doesn't need any any description. Um, you You've just written. You've just written one of uh, the elements that we often uh, oversee when we are subtitling for uh, deaf audiences. Anything that is on screen, what's the point of subtitling? Yeah. If there are visual cues, why are we adding extra layers of difficulty? Um, let's forget about those. Mm. Then. Subtitling those are the easy ones. Subtitling all the others are the most difficult um, elements when it comes to subtitling sound. Yeah, there was an example yesterday. Um, from, I think it was yesterday, the clip from Up. And there was the, the ambulance and that subtitle sirens. Blowing, but it wasn't needed because you could see the ambulance, see its lights were flashing and it was if especially you know if, if you were um someone who was uh deaf and from birth and they never heard so you know you wouldn't they wouldn't what does that mean to you or you, but the the lights indicate enough mm -hmm. yeah and unless the ambulance was not on screen that uh, information yeah. would have been necessary but in that particular case that you are mentioning peter that was the example shown by one of the presenters yesterday, we could see the flashing of the lights in the ambulance. So I agree that information is not necessary. So if anything, we may be over subtitling. Mm. Yeah. And it's also yeah. very interesting that when talking to deaf uh, patrons, very often they have said, then if I cannot see it, why should I want to know about the sound? Uh, that adds another layer of difficulty. Uh, what sounds really merit 
uh, subtitling because if we can't see them, what is the point of talking about them? Unless yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Narrative value, right? Unless they are absolutely essential for us to make sense of the storyline. Yeah, if you walk around in your everyday life and you're not obviously seeing subtitles in your field of vision for every for every little sound, why do you then why would you then need them if it's something on the screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a possibility, yeah. Okay, so here we already have um, a big question for us subtitlers working for deaf viewers. Um, might we not be over subtitling? I'd love to hear somebody else. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Lucia, yes, go ahead. Mm, hi, good afternoon. Um, I think that sometimes we pay extra importance or we give extra importance to the image. So we forget or we unvalue what sounds can uh, provide, what the information that sounds can provide. So we uh, work over subtitling, imagining that this image is so important that it has to be uh, reinforced or highlight, but actually they can see it. So what they need from us is to highlight what they cannot see, what they cannot hear. And is that what sometimes gives so much information that we even people who can hear without any uh, difficulty uh, forget or are not allowed to to hear. So it could it could be said that sometimes we need subtitles also for people who can who have not no difficulty for for hearing because they they just hear they don't listen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm also reading from what you are saying that we are all probably over subtitling. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Probably yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think there was another person. Uh, Xin Ying Chen, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. Yes, um, when I did my, actually my master assignment years ago, um, it's a course about SDH, and when I try to, um, how to say, transcribe or describe the off-screen sounds. I, I, I suffer a lot, to be honest, at the moment, because um, sometimes there's just some, some noise or someone's talking off-screen, and that's a very, I think, at the moment, that's very important for me to decide whether this sound just noise, it just present the context the speaker or the character is was in, or it's a hint for what will happen later. Yeah, but if that's really a hint um, showing what will happen later, would that be a spoiler if I just review the secret? Yeah, so I, I, I suffer a lot and still at this moment, I still have I, I still didn't find a perfect solution for these cases. Don't worry, you're not the only one. Yeah, that's a good point to to include in the in the discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But you would agree that the more aware and the more um, conversant we are with the decoding of sound and actually the decoding of film in general, uh, the more equipped we will be to make those decisions of whether to subtitle or not subtitle. If it's going to be a spoiler, uh, we know that we cannot uh, <laughs> spoil the fun. Um, and that ability to make decisions is what will be the difference between an excellent professional and somebody who's just giving you to go. Um, so don't feel too nervous about it because I think we all, we all, we are all there. Uh, yeah. Even those of us who've been around for a little while longer, 
um, I'm still struggling uh, deciding, uh, should I, shouldn't I? Yeah. And I'm not even right. saying, oh, will I? It's just, should I or should I not? Yeah. It's a big question. Yeah, to yeah. me or not to me, that's the question, to subtitle or not to subtitle. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. And, and sorry, I have another question because I was a bit late, so if I ask a stupid question or I have asked a question that you have already discussed, just forgive me. Yeah. Um, I spend a lot of time on finding a proper onomatopoeia. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a native speaker of, uh, I'm not a native English speaker. So I, yeah, I spend a lot of time to, to find or to decide the exact onomatopoeia I should use. But um, and the same, in the meantime, I have another question just come across my mind because I'm not a native speaker and I believe that um, some audience who are, uh, who are not a native speaker as well would need the subtitles. Even, even they, are for, they are designed for um, hard of hearing or deaf, but somehow we are kind of hard of hearing when watching a foreign film or any video. Yeah, so um, for this non-native speaker or the hard of hearing, do this on a metal beers make sense? Mm. I'm not for sure, because yeah, they, they look a little bit strange for me, even for me. So I, I'm not sure if I put this this word, this strange word on the screen. Could anyone take it? Does, you, does it make you, sense? You have made an incredibly important and relevant point, yes. Um, the whole story about uh, using or not using an um has been discussed and questioned and questioned again. If somebody has never heard, what would the onomatopoeia um, mean? Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. <laughs> yeah, no. I've never heard bow wow. Uh, what, what does bow wow mean? But then uh, if the dog uh, is bow-wowing in a different context, it may be woof-woof. Uh, and there comes the answer to your issue as a foreigner. Um, the onomatopoeia will also differ depending on the language. Um, it's difficult. Uh, personally, um, I avoid onomatopoeia uh, as much as I can. Because it's it's difficult. We we are banking on um, a sound system that deaf people do not master because they cannot hear, and we are talking about those who are um, profoundly deaf. Um, and even onomatopoeia are also culturally bound, and culturally bound elements uh, become very ambiguous. Uh, so yeah, it is a problem. Uh, not to be solved so soon, I would imagine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we continue just a little bit more? Yeah, let's go on. Let's go on. We, uh, oh, time is flying. I'll try to, I'll try to fly too. Can you see my screen? Are we good? Juan, are we okay? Yeah, 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 perfectly okay. Okay. I'll try to run over what we have to uh, still think about. Um, about synchrony for a little while. Uh, we expect to find synchrony between image and sound. And we know that um, attention is directed to certain movements uh, or amplified by the sounds that come with those um, visual elements. Um, in fact, one of the rules for interlingual subtitling even is we, the subtitle only comes in a little bit later, uh, just a few frames after the speech has actually started. Um, we connect, our brain connects uh, the words to the lips and to, um, we expect the synchrony 
um, to happen in life and we expect it to happen in film as well. Um, even though we are not rationally conscious of it, our percep uh, perceptive system reacts more or less violently to audiovisual stimuli according to whether the sound comes before or after the visual stimulus. And this is particularly important when we are thinking about subtitling for uh, deaf and hard of hearing audiences, because the golden rule uh, that goes with SDH, that we should be in synchrony with image and not in synchrony with sound, will be bringing, adding a number of issues to um, reading time, to um, subtitle presentation. Uh, and if anybody is out there looking for a theme, for a thesis, I would imagine, or I'm absolutely sure, that analyzing synchrony between sound image and then synchrony between subtitles, sound, image, uh, would yield very, very interesting uh, information. Looking at reception and perception, uh, how we process these elements. Um, and I'm not talking about deaf people necessarily. I'm talking about all of us as we are trying to integrate um, and trying, we naturally try to create synchrony between what we see and what we hear. And if we are adding an extra layer of subtitles, we again will be making a huge effort to create some sort of logic, synchronous logic between these different layers. Okay, moving on. Like dreamscapes, the language of sound imagery has parallels to the figures of speech in our verbal tradition. Up until now, we've been talking about real sound, synchrony, wanting to provide real sense to what we hear, trying to find the source, trying to be specialized listeners and seeing the so what elements of that particular uh, sound. Being a professional audiovisual translator, demands that we become very acute readers of acoustic imagery. And sound can be a simile, a hyperbole, a metaphor, add irony, just add uh, more vivid, um, <laughs> a vivid existence of any of the elements in film. It is incredibly important that we add an extra layer to our listening expertise. One of reading the, the um, I'll call it the literary, even <laughs> the literary strategies that come with the use of sound in film. This is where the magic happens, this is where poetry happens, this is where art happens in film. It's when synchrony is the least important element in our um, sound system, where we are invited to make sense of what is not obvious. The question remains, and we go back to the little conversation that we've just had, how can we go about subtitling that which is poetic, that which is subliminary, that which triggers the imagination, that which is nothing other than a literary subterfuge to create some kind of emotion or imagery in this other part of our brain that is not necessarily the 
objective, um, let's make sense of real life around us. This asks us to listen to sound very, very carefully to understand what sound is referencing to in film. We will have universal sounds that will be easily understood anywhere in the world. The heartbeat, the growling, um, uh, the knocking at a door. Um, these sounds don't need a lot to be easily understood and for us to attribute some kind of synchronous understanding of what the sound is. Problems come into um, in, in force when we are looking at cultural sound. And each culture carries its sound mark through the environment. Actually, I'm sorry, you cannot hear my environment at this precise point. Outside, I'm hearing the call for prayer. If this were in a film, if we were in the film and this call for prayer was there, um, automatically we would be providing um, religious information, social information, uh, spatial, geographic uh, information, um, so much information that can only be read through the cultural context in which sound takes place. So reading sound in its cultural uh, elements um, is something that we have to learn and study and read and uh, travel and travel with open ears because most often we go to places as tourists to see things and not very often do we stop to listen to the heartbeat of that particular place. Now, sound references in film will also take us to historical time, um, will take us to different moments, even without words. We can identify moments. Um, let, let me give you the, the instance of uh, if we are hearing the yellow submarine by the, the Beatles, uh, any Beatles uh, song. Um, we will obviously be placing them in the 60s, in the 70s of 1960, 1970. The pop revolution, uh, the social um, upheavals that came um, all around the world in that historical moment. So being carefully, um, uh, being careful listeners and making sense of these um, universal cultural historical references is absolutely essential. We also need to think about the geographical, um, geographical hearing, geographical referencing. As I was saying, uh, just outside I had the call for prayer. You wouldn't hear this, I would imagine, in, in my home country, in Portugal or in Spain, um, unless there was a mosque close by. As well, how natural would it be to hear the call for prayer in a context such as Europe, if that is what is being shown in the film? How would it go naturally and um, organically uh, if the film was to be placed in an Arabic context in the Middle East, for instance. So being aware of these references of the imagery that comes with sound will make us much stronger um, subtitlers or audiovisual translators. I've been talking about sound in general, and I've been giving you examples from the soundscape and mainly from um, what we call sound effects. We kind of package them all under this uh, category of sound effects. But if anything takes all of this to another level, it will be music. And music in film is sound taken to 
that exponential place of referencing and imagery and feeling and um, non-synchronous uh, and beyond the screen, uh, taking us to places that are so difficult to be conveyed in the form of subtitles. The more I learn about sound, the more I feel that SDH is such a reductionist activity. And the more I feel that deaf people are really cut off from an incredibly important component of life. They are cut off from um, the language of the system. They will be that minority if they have uh, a sign language as their mother tongue. But they will, above all, be cut off from this, the experience of um, letting yourself drown in this soup that is around you and that you are not even aware of. And that will be changing everything in you from your heartbeat to your mood, um, will be changing um, even your cellular, uh, cellular structure, I am told. Um, and how can we, audiovisual translators, compensate for that lack? And here I'm deliberately using the word lack um, because there is this huge gap in the experience in experiencing the world. The world that is contained in a film. Let's very quickly go over music. And we know that music will be creating order out of chaos. Uh, rhythm imposes unanimity upon the divergent. Melody imposes continuity upon the disjointed. And harmony imposes compatibility upon the incongruous. How? deep this is. You're talking about order, making order out of chaos. Um, how can we go about subtitling something that is organizing chaos? How can we um, convey the um, what music is giving those of us who hear? Um, the experiences, the emotions um, that we are all so lucky to uh, to um, use and to have. Let us not forget that deaf people can also hear music. If not in all these layers, they will probably not hear melody, but they will certainly hear rhythm. This said, we may need to be very, very careful when we subtitle these and even think of ways to help our deaf users, our patrons, deaf patrons, to pick up those rhythms, to visually be directed in ways that they will activate their selective hearing and focus on particular sounds and who knows enjoy that that magic that comes with music what function does music have in film it's an emotional signifier which we have already mentioned it offers continuity which we have already mentioned and it is a narrative cueing now this element is really, really important because it does add narrative unity, but more importantly still, it is a cueing element. It is kind of telling us, watch out, it's reminding us, ooh, ooh that music is here, haha, <laughs> something is going to happen. It's not by chance that different characters are in a film are associated to different musical scores. It's not by chance that different atmospheres are punctuated with the same musical sounds. Being aware 
of how music is being used to push the narrative, to bring the whole together, to manipulate emotion and to lead us to places and spaces um, will give us keys um, to um, a world uh, of uh, possibilities. Music offer us emotion, sorrow, fear, jealousy, impatience. We don't need to be musicians to understand these feelings, but if we are musicians, we will understand them better. In patience, music will be rapidly changing with annoying modulations. Sorrow, music will be slow, languid, uh, caressing, uh, probably dissonant harmony. There, there is a whole code, that uh, encoding system that uh, makes music uh, arrive at holes that will be creating different emotions. Um, just in the opposite end, happiness, laughter, love, compassion, innocence. We can collect these, or we can feel these emotions through the way music is composed. But music will also be giving us cultural and geographical and historical um, um, references, as I've mentioned earlier on. I was talking about uh, my deaf ear to the Middle Eastern uh, sound, the minor key melody with all the quarter tone ornamenting oh, 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 kind of um, sounds. My ear can't find any beauty in that, but all I need to do is hear it and bang, I am, I am taken to a geographical uh, location. Think about Latin American music or the jazzy uh, sounds that take us to New York or uh, the violins or the accordions that will take us to Rome or Paris. Um, we learn these codes. And again, it's something that us as translators need to work on. Because the more we learn and know about music, about sound effects, about the nature of one plus one equals one, how image and sound come together to impact on each other and change each other, create new stories, um, unless we become proficient readers of audiovisual text, and in particular of sound, we won't really be strong um, audiovisual translators. I'm now ending my presentation with one last quote from Lynch, uh, his book Soundscape. Sound is 50% of a film at least. In some scenes, it's almost 100%. It's the thing that can add so much emotion to a film. It's a thing that can add all the mood and create a larger world. It sets the tone and it moves things. Sound is a great pull into a different world. And it has to work with the picture. But without it, you've lost half the film. And I now stop sharing. And one more round of questions and comments. Who would like to talk about music? Hmm. Talk about imagery. What are we doing about this when we are subtitling? How are we going about conveying what is only suggested? Should we even be suggesting? Sorry, should we be should we be writing what is suggested? If it is suggested, what should we be doing about this? The moment we are writing it, it's no longer suggested. It is bang on there. 
we are changing the actual ethos of the source text to degrees that may be dramatic even. I'd love to hear you. Who'd like to add? Help us think. I know you know much more about this than I do. Let's hear people, please. Any comment? I was hoping Peter would come back. Yeah. He's Hello. <laughs> Hello again. Sorry, just I'm digesting the, uh, the talk and thank you for it, by the way. Um, I just would ask you um, if there was one. I mean, this, this is a very big question asking for a very short answer, but if there was one uh, practical thing that you would want everyone here going forward to apply to their work, uh, what might it be? What would be the, the change you want to see in the world, so to speak? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you ask for a short question? Um, less you, you can give a long yeah. answer if you like. Less is more. Mm. Less is more. We are overdoing it in subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing. We are, um, I don't think we are given enough time or we aren't giving ourselves enough time or the system isn't giving us enough time to read film. Uh, I normally tell my students 80% um, of your time in your project should be given to decoding the original text. Once you've understood all of this, um, life will be so much easier for you. And when it comes to sound, you need to listen, listen, watch, watch, listen, listen, watch, watch. And deciding how much you are going to subtitle is oof, so difficult. Um, if anything, when in doubt, leave it out. Should I should I subtitle or not? If you are asking yourself, don't subtitle it. Less is more. Um, should I bring to the fore what is only hidden? If it is hidden, why bring it to the fore? Because usually when we have hidden sound codes, we will also have visual codes. There will be something there if there is any visual code there, why are we? And I'm talking against myself. I too uh, fall in the trap of trying to give everything. It's the same happens with audio description. Oh, I have to describe everything. Everything is so important. I really have to. But no, silence is necessary. And I'm beginning. I'm learning, I'm beginning to understand, only beginning to understand that subtitles also need to be silent. If that makes sense. Yes, it, it does. Yeah, it does. That's good. Well, thank you. I think that's a very nice answer. <laughs> There's a hand up as well. Yeah, there was a hand. Hello. Um... First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Really inspiring presentation. I have another question. Um, I'm sorry for my sound, <laughs> um, but um, I've been really fortunate to work with directors uh, while doing SDH. And uh, I always consult them as far as music and even sounds are concerned. But sometimes <laughs> I do have a problem. Uh, because uh, the directors asked me to add some sounds and I tell them, listen, I use really good headphones and I cannot hear them, but I really use this tiny sound there. And I asked them, is it really that important to the scene? But I used it. I paid for it so much and I want you to add the description of it. So my question is, um, usually I try my best uh, to somehow find the middle <laughs> between my idea, uh, what would be the best uh, solution for the deaf and hard of hearing, 
but sometimes the di directors are really pressing on it and you have to somehow add what they want because they are the ones ordering <laughs> uh, the SDH. So what would be your suggestion dealing with directors in this case? Uh, how I envy you, how lucky you are to be working with the directors. I wish we could all be working with the directors and I would love to have those conversations with the directors and asking them exactly what I've been asking you during this session. Yeah, you had to pay so much for the sound, but this sound is there only to suggest something and to add um, a particular feeling. Yes, I would love the deaf person to, to pick, uh, pick up that little nuance. What is the narrative value? If it's not there, will the story collapse? Will, if, there, if, if the narrative value of that particular sound is one that, if it's pushing the story forward, by all means, I will, I will walk the earth just to find the exact word to say the pling of the, fine, Mr. Director. Um, it's about dialogue and it's about having this very conscious conversation with them. Uh, how much, very often I feel that even the filmmaker does not read what he or she is adding to the film. Because art is very much a um, intuitive, sensory experience. Uh, uh, the, the, the soundscape is created almost in a, I would like to call it an organic manner. What if we add the sound and we add that one? Ah, oh, but we have a little treble here and let's just have a little quiver over there. We just have to look at the soundscape maps. Uh, often they have about 20 different tracks just for a little second of a little sign, uh, part of the soundscape. The, the whole thing here, when we are when we are subtitling, we are mediators. And we have to be functional. We can't be adding extra, extra difficulty to somebody who is already having difficulty reading the written text. Every time a new subtitle pops up, their head goes into an extra knot. Let's only make them read what they really, really, really need to read. So yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so I, much. I, I will continue envying you. I wish I could have these conversations with filmmakers. They are really very, very extremely helpful sessions, I must say. And I am fortunate that Lithuanian film producers work with me and I do ask them to work with me, in fact. So thank you for your answers. Amazing. Well done. Keep it up. <laughs> thank you, Jurgita. Wonderful. Um, may I suggest we have a practical exercise just to finish off? Okay. Yeah. Let me tell you what we need to do. I'm going to be asking uh, Juan Pedro, please, to um, play a little audio clip. Uh, would you all put your best earphones on, please? And as you listen, you are going to listen to it twice or perhaps even three times. Who knows? Uh, the first time you listen to it, I want you to think of the storyline. What is all this about? And if possible, let's start with our very reductionist hearing. Let's identify sound. Please list the sounds you hear. Preferably in order. Uh, some of these sounds will be repeated. Uh, don't be disheartened if that happens. Uh, two tasks. One, list all the sounds you hear. Two, what is the narrative? What is the story? What is being told? Ready to go? First listening. Yeah. Should we go? Yes, please. Okay. 
Ready? Go. to you. I can see Juan Pedro smiling. <laughs> and I can see some, some dirty minds picking away. But what if it's not what you want to see? <laughs> but what if it is what you must be what are we going to do about this if we have to subtitle this what are we going to describe what are we going to say are we going to censor what are we going to do about this what have we heard True, I said we have to see and hear. But this one we will not see at all because this is a video clip uh, produced by Vodafone, shown in cinema rooms, uh, simply to sell Vodafone um, stuff. Ay, 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 we are in trouble here. May I suggest we listen to it once more? And please write down the sounds and let's create a narrative. Okay, let's go.
to you. Thank you. Shall we share the screen with everybody now? And I'm all ears. What is the storyline? How difficult is it for us to create the story? What sounds did we hear? Where did it take us? What previous information did we collect from among our previous experience? Okay. There is an answer in the chat. To me, this audio evokes a full immersion entertainment service as a super immersed movie night. Uh huh. Why do you say that, Irene? Please do tell us. She's having problem with the audio. That's why she's uh, typing. I in see. The chat. We'll wait for your answer. In the meantime, who would like to voice? We're talking about sounder. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's start by what sounds did you hear? Okay, Peter offers a huge list of uh, sounds. Sorry, just I was writing it as as the uh, clip was playing. So just the literal sounds like what I'm hearing, not in, not in trying to infer anything about the context. Which, by the way, the uh, head the strong headphone suggestion made a lot of sense. <laughs> um, right away um but even some of this like i've written and been quite literal but i thought actually feminine laughter doesn't even quite because so, so i forgot you know i still put laughter and i thought actually do i say feminine because i to try and get a bit more about the the character then it's not even just that it's not just laughter it's, it's a like flirtatious kind of laughter so there's even there's another layer on the sound there as well so I don't know if that that list is sufficient to convey that kind of narrative, which I think I think everyone got, but maybe not. Right. Very interesting that Irene um, has transformed this into a movie night watching rather than yes. <laughs> look at story, uh, creating a story out of it. She's creating a scene in which to place some kind of story. Good. Excellent. Um, I totally agree with what you are saying, uh, Peter. Um, we have identified sounds, but then we may need to go into nuanced uh, mm -hmm. versions of these sounds, that flirtation uh, that comes with the little giggle um, sound there. Um, excellent. Irene even heard the snoring. How many of you heard the snoring? <laughs> My immediate thought as soon as the clip started was, oh, someone's recorded me snoring. <laughs> that, that's what's <laughs> happened here. Right. That's why uh, the reason for the shushing. Good. There is another yeah, hand. Eden is point of view, yeah. Uh -huh. Let's not wake up this creature who's fallen asleep. Lovely. There is another hand up. Uh, uh, yes. Thing. I yeah. wanted to. Pilar. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sure. 
I wanted to say that it reminded me from to the scene from Ratatouille, in which Remy is sneaking into the different houses of a building. So uh, for me, that was the storyline. And I think it would be hard to subtitle, but I think I would be give priority to the most important noises uh, which, of each scene. Which do you think are the most important noises? Uh, well, the one that you hear the most at each moment. For example, first the the liquid after the woman's laughter, and yeah, I mean it would be hard, really. Very, very difficult. Yes. Yeah. And without the images, how close might we be to say that we are watching porn? And how would we be dealing with sounds that are in the sphere of taboo, should that be the case? Now, I'm not saying it is or it's not. I'm just asking you, what would we do? about subtitling any of these sounds. Why have we chosen to create the Ratatouille storyline or the people uh, watching a movie uh, in a fantastic immersive movie, movie experience? Um, or why would we be saying that this is an affair going wrong? Um, somebody else says it sounds like people having sex. But they might just be jumping on the bed trying to catch a bug or something. <laughs> That's an possibility, yeah, Marina. You're right. <laughs> Absolutely. So our our imagination was um, went loose, and that's exactly what a Vodafone wanted to do. Um, actually, it's a campaign of five absolutely exquisite soundscapes, and how difficult this is for us to make sense or to um, even create a storyline simply because we do not have image. Had we image, all of this ambiguity would have disappeared. Absolutely. And we come back to my title of our workshop. We need to see sound to make sense of sound. Uh, and as audiovisual translators, whoa, um, what are we going to make of sound? Uh, how much do we need to still learn about sound to become truly proficient? And it goes across the board, not only for SDH. Excellent. Final words, final comments. Um, anything you would like to add? Any further questions? Uh, let's use the last three to five minutes to wrap up with your thoughts. Where do we go from here? What have I missed out? What should I have addressed that I did not touch upon? Please help me to be stronger at this. How many people do we have on board, Juan Pedro? Uh, right now, uh, we are around 35 people. We can't have 35 silent people, please. Thank you, Peter, for helping us throughout. Yes. What about the rest of you, please? I'd love to hear you. Well, just write the comments if you don't if you don't want to speak. I just want to say thank thank you for your talk. It's been the workshop's been very, very interesting. I'm just curious about because um, that's a great way to, you know, the demonstration at the end to say the importance of the visual, just to say, you know, when we're talking about being, yeah, unable to hear what's going on, how much of a of a handicap is that versus not being able to see. So it, it's an interesting question. There's, there's the, the other side of the coin, I suppose. I'd be interested in seeing an example 
where it worked the other way, where we can see everything, but by not being able to hear, we're, we're left somewhat in the dark as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was, uh, my intention was really to focus on sound. Oh, uh, yes. I totally see your point. Um, the exercise could have gone the other way around. Mm. That's how we normally go about it when we are doing this uh, at university. Uh, we get our students to watch the movie without sound and then to figure out what sounds could be there. Uh, yes, absolutely, yes. It's the other way. We, we went the other way around for this exercise, but I agree with you. We would need to swap and just look at image and imagine sound. But I think the other way around is easier than this. This is really difficult. And that's why audio description in itself is also a huge story. Uh, and it's not only about image, it is also about sound. Yeah, definitely. COST, European Cooperation in Science and Technology. This video is based upon work from COST Action Lead Me CA19142, supported by COST. COST is a funding agency for research and innovation networks. Our actions help connect research initiatives across Europe and enable scientists to grow their ideas by sharing them with their peers. This boosts their research, career and innovation. www.cost.eu This work is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution CCBY, funded by the Horizon 2020 Framework Programme of the European Union.